invites and encourages all who are seeking a community to empower, support, and explore deeper understanding of spirituality and recovery of all kinds. We join together with our family and loved ones in our journey to enlightenment and recovery and supporting one another spiritually without judgment or prejudice. Hi, thank you for joining us today at A Place of Faith. Today, we are going to explore the spiritual principle of compassion. Our own Becky R. is going to be doing our lesson, our presentation, and Patricia will be doing meditation. I'll be jumping in and out, and we have with us our wonderful Jody doing music for us today. So, let's get started. Please join me in prayer. Higher power, great spirit, thank you for being with us in every single way. Thank you for helping us to be stronger, to be wiser, and to keep going no matter what comes up against us. God, we know we can turn to our faith, to our spirituality, and be more than we have ever been before. And so it is. Come crashing down You'll find blessings all around Don't look out, just look within For you a new world will begin So open your heart to love Open your heart to love Then you will to love and reach out to your fellow man and always lend a helping hand the greatest thing that you can do is give love and receive it too so open your heart to love open your heart to love then you will know what dreams are made of open your heart to love and open your heart open your heart open your heart to love that's wonderful thank you as always my name is Becky R, and on the spiritual principle of compassion, I am here to talk to you about the concepts to contemplate for contemplation. In 1206, Giovanni Bernadon, the 24-year-old son of a wealthy merchant, went on a pilgrimage to St. Peter's of Balaskia in Rome. He could not help but notice the contrast between the, the poor, rich and the poor, how big a gap there was. He would notice the brilliant mosaics, the spiral columns and all this, and then there's this poverty and people begging outside. So he persuaded one of the beggars to switch clothes with him. And of course he was wealthy, so the beggar looked wealthy, but he spent the rest of the day begging for alms in the life of this. And he it was one of the first great empathetic empathy experiments in human history, at least that we have recorded. 
this episode, this, what this happened to this young man was the turning point in his life. And he soon founded a religious order whose brothers worked for the poor and the lepers and who gave up war, the worldly goods to live in poverty like those that they served. Now, I didn't know his name. You may have known it. Giovanni Bernadon is known as St. Francis of Assisi. And at the end of the, uh, our, our talks every week, we say that prayer. So to me, it's, it's just an amazing concept, this compassion that he learned at such a young age. And he said that uh, he is remembered for declaring, grant me the treasures of sublime poverty. Permit the distinctive sign of our order to be that it does not possess anything of its own beneath the sun for the glory of your name and that it is no, has no other patrony than begging. So another one, our greatest example of compassion from the Bible that I, that I was, when I was researching was Psalms 86, 15. It says, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Another one I found that was wonderful in the Bible was God's compassion is infinite and eternal. In fact, his compassion, his compassions are new every morning. Every morning. So no matter what happened the night before, every morning it's new. They never fail. And that's from Lemonations 3, 20, 22, 23. I hadn't heard of that one before, so I had to go research it. God comforts his people with compassion. Compassion is not just a feeling with someone, but seeking the, to change the situation. Frequently, people think compassion and love are merely sentimental. No. They are very demanding. If you are going to be compassionate, be prepared for action. And that's a quote from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Those are my concepts to contemplate for today. Thank you. My name is Linda B, and it is my honor to share with you the principle in action for compassion. I could actually give so many different examples of how the compassion of someone else has, has touched my life, has changed my life, has even changed the path that my life was on. I am going to go back in time a little bit and honor someone who touched my life deeply. So bear with me, because this, uh, this is likely to cause some emotion to show up. When I first got clean and sober in the first uh, months, the first year, I was working at restoring uh, custody of my youngest child, and I was working with a social worker. And we all know social workers working in the, in the field with CPS have a pretty bad rap. Uh, not caring, not compassionate, no time, won't check in on you. I am, and we've heard so many stories. My social worker was, her name was Mary, and she was so not the, the ones you hear of. She was way outside the norm. And shortly after I'd been given custody of my youngest back, he was just a toddler. I had been living on the streets, and I'd managed to find a job. He actually was given back to me while I was in sober living, which wasn't supposed to happen. Everybody was trying to help, so much compassion, right? And I got a studio apartment that I could have him in. I was going by bus everywhere that there was to go, didn't have a car, not even sure I had a driver's license at the time. And my social worker, Mary, took me to the store and bought me, out of her own pocket, a stroller for my toddler. Still gets to me. 
I knew if I tried to share this story, you would hear that in my voice. And she told me, <clears throat> how do you say thank you for that? She got one big enough, and I wouldn't hold all my laundry, but it would hold grocery bags and, and my kid. And wow, that was so helpful. And, you know, it's like, how do I thank you? How do I thank you? And she told me, you can't. <laughs> Nothing you can do. This is a part of my spiritual tithe. I'm giving forward because when I was in need, people gave things that I needed to me. And to this day, I'm still paying that forward. And for me, that's the principle of compassion in action. Thank you. I see a scene of empty eyes. Their silence speaks that life's not fair They feel the weight of all their hunger And I feel the weight of their despair And that's a burden hard to bear Well, I can't change the world But I can live with open hands and I can't change the world But I can give all that I can I can pray and I can love And when all is said and done I can't change the world But I can change the world for one Hope can drown in so much need And that's a poor excuse to turn away Cause I have seen a grateful smile Shining on a person's face and That's why I have faith well, I can't change the world, but I can live with open hands. And I can't change the world, but I can give all that I can. I can pray and I can love. And when all is said and done, no, I can't change the world. But I can change the world for one Half a world away Or just across the street May my eyes be open to Anyone in need Well, I can't change the world No, I can't change the world I can pray and I can love and when all is said and done I can change the world but I can change the world for one I can change the world can change the world for one. Oh, I can change the world for Change the world 
for one. Thank you, Jody. Let us center ourselves right now in this loving place. Let us focus on the love around us, within us, whirling like a tornado from within, just spreading the love and compassion outward. Take a breath. Focus on your breathing. Calmly allow yourself to take care of you. Compassion for all includes compassion for ourselves. Connect with this joy and this calmness. Let the music envelop you. Feel the love Feel your infinite connection with all around you. Breathe in the love-filled air. Your inner whispers ground you. Listen to this compassionate voice. Breathe in calmness. Remember, caring for others also requires caring for yourself. Focus on the love, the joy, the excitement that you have, knowing that you are caring and compassionate for yourself and for others. A compassionate gesture doesn't have to be a large, big, overwhelming gesture. Compassionate gesture can be helping somebody take a box of detergent off the shelf in a grocery store that they can't reach. That's seeing that others need help and you're there to help. If your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. So embrace yourself first. Trust me, you deserve it.
Remember, you have been criticizing yourself for years, and it hasn't worked. Try approving of yourself and see what happens. Breathe in the love. Allow it to embrace you. Feel your body calm and renewed. Feel your spirit connected and renewed. Feel yourself embracing compassion for others. Also embracing compassion for yourself. Take in another exhilarating breath. Feel the love. Feel the joy. Be happy. Open your eyes and smile. Be thankful for everything that you see, everything that you know that's all around you. This is love. This is who you are. And because of this, the world is such a better place because you are in it. Be blessed. Be joyful. Be happy. You are love. Namaste. thing going on there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Becky R, and I'm going to speak to you on the principle of compassion. First of all, I would love to say thank you for the share, Linda. That was wonderful. For the meditation, Patricia, beautiful. And for the music, Jody, you just rock my heart. Every time you play, I just was like, he's going to make me cry again. And you do. You know, but it's a good cry. That's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So let's begin with prayer. Father, Mother, God, we thank you for this time together to connect, to be in spirit with each other, and to know that we are compassion. We are love. We are your children. We are with you. And we have everything that you are at our fingertips always. Thank you. Amen. Okay, compassion. This was fun. <laughs> this, is, this is actually being taped on a day that's kind of difficult for me. I'll start with that. So if I come to tears a little bit during it, um, this year, just a few months ago, my father passed away. And why well, should transition to the other side? Because he's here. He listens to me, which is really kind of amazing because I know that he hears me. But today's his birthday, so happy birthday, Dad. He would have been 89 years old. So thank you for spending this time with me and with him and with everybody here. So com what they define, com the Webster's Dictionary defines compassion as a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it, Okay. Understanding that hatred and revenge never cease through the returned hatred and revenge intent. Facing hatred with compassion 
loving one's enemy, overly moving towards equanimity, toward all. If I can get my, there we go, oop. But exactly what does that mean about compassion? Because a lot of times people confuse compassion with empathy, okay? So compassion is often confused with empathy and sympathy, most likely because each of the, the, the way they're constructed is to be associated with helping. We're going to help the person, okay? But unlike compassion, empathy does not incorporate the readiness in order to act to relieve the suffering. And sympathy is the same way. Sympathy is a feeling of care and concern for someone, which is often associated with the wish to see them happier, but there's no action behind this, these words. These are feelings inside of us, right? Sympathy is an experience of the feeling of sorrow for someone else's misfortune. With compassion, there is a recognition of the other person's emotional state and a desire to act in order to help it. This is the part that we have to, I talk about this a lot with it. When, when you hear me talking, I may, may talk about it too much, I'm not sure. But knowing these principles and acting on these principles are two different things, right? So we can know about compassion, but acting on it in, is in this order. There's a cognitive component, it's an awareness of suffering. I understand that they're suffering. There's the effective component, I'm sympathetic, a sympathetic concern related to being emotionally moved by suffering. Oh, that, you know, that brings me to tears because they're hurting. There's the intentional component, is a wish to see them eat the ease of suffering. That's like, okay, they're suffering. Mm, I really wish they weren't. And then there's the motivational component, and that's a responsiveness or a readiness to step in and help. Right? So it's all of those combined. It's not just, you know, oh, I see it, and there it is, and, you know, it's the acting upon it. So does everybody deserve compassion? You know, who decides who's worth giving compassion to? And this one is really struck home a lot lately, too, because there's been some things coming up in my life that... Um, people are very surprised when they say, you know, this person hurt you and we're coming to you and how can you be so compassionate towards them? And I'm like, because that's, who I am love and I am compassion and I have went through this and I know that on the other side, they will find this too. They will also be healed. And what I'm hoping for you and your family is that you become healed. And to me, that's compassion because I walked into it knowing that it was an act of love and compassion that was going to heal a family. So what would your higher what would our higher power say about it? Who who deserves compassion, who doesn't? You know, somebody hurts you or or does something bad to you. I kind of think my higher power would say, Hello, I'm the boss around here, <laughs> you know. I'm the one that decides. And if I decide one person deserves it, then we all deserve it. That's kind of the story that I get when I talk about this. So I found some stories online. They're really brief. One of them is called The Widower. It says, after a long shift at a fire department, Matt Swizzell fell asleep while driving home and crashed into another vehicle. Uh, he took the life of a pregnant mother. Her name was June Fitzgerald and injured their, her 19-month-old daughter. And according to the today.com, uh, Fitzgerald's husband, a full-time pastor, asked for the man's diminished sentence. So he went to the trial and said, please lessen the sentence. And he also began meeting with the man for coffee and conversation. And for many years, the two of them remained very close. So that's an act of compassion. Even at a huge loss to himself, he knew that the man was working and he fell asleep and it was, it was an accident that happened, right? So here's one that wasn't quite so accidental. It's called The Unlikely Pardoner. An Iranian woman named Shamir Alajad, and I'm going to murder that name over there, right? She had told the Associated Press that retribution had been her only thought as after her teenage son was murdered. All she could think about was retribution, right? So she put it at the time. In, in Iran, they have a different 
state of, of, of way to sentence people. The family can actually sentence and, com and commit the, um, the act of murder if the person is found guilty. So as this man is going to be hung, the mother of this teenager that lost her teenager walked up, slapped him across the face, and took the noose off his neck. So she was still hurting, but yet the compassion, it was, she said it was a last minute decision. She didn't even know she was gonna do it because all she could think about before that was, he deserves to die because I lost my son. And here's one more. The compassion officer, his name's Stephen McDonald. He was a young police officer. This was way back in 1986 when he was shot by a teenager in New York Central Park, an, an, an incident that left him paralyzed. He said, I forgave the shooter because I believed the only thing worse than receiving a bullet in my spine would have been to nurture revenge in my heart. So McDonald, that's what McDonald wrote. While the younger man was serving his prison sentence, McDonald corresponded with him, hoping that one day the two of them could work together to demonstrate forgiveness and nonviolence. This is the ultimate of compassion. Unfortunately, the young man died just days after he was released from a motorcycle accident. So these are real in-depth compassion examples. But as our meditation said, and as our wonderful sharing went, compassion can be so small. I mean, it can be a smile, right? It can be a holding the door open for someone when they need to come in. It can be taking the walker down the steps so that the elderly person can get down or up the steps. Compassion comes in all different ways, right? And who deserves it? Pretty much we all deserve it, right? So there's, there are ways to co cultivate compassion if you don't already have it. And Lisa Rankin, MD, she's a physician at New York Times. She's a best-selling author. She said there's some easy tips on how to do this. So we're going to run through some of her easy tips. If you don't already have compassion, ways to build it. Start by practicing, practicing self-compassion. Well, there's a good one, right? <laughs> Even in our meditation. who It's really so much easier. And I know with this being in recovery, it was so easy to serve and show compassion to everybody else. But coming back at myself, was just like, that, was a, that was a hard lesson to learn. I'm glad I've learned it. Ooh, yeah. But it wasn't one of my easier lessons because it was easier for me to help somebody else. So compassion, according to P Pidma Chodron, she's an amazing author, she's a monk. Compassion for others begins with kindness to ourselves. Kindness to ourselves. And that can be in little steps, too. If it's something that is new to us, we can start with baby steps. It can be easy. Shut the TV off and take a bath, you know. Set that last little piece of work aside and give yourself a few minutes to meditate. Compassion can come in so many different ways. So the second tip is to put yourself in someone else's shoes. That's a little bit harder, especially if you're angry or in a rage about someone you feel like you've some kind of injustice has happened to you. And the thing that happened to me and that we went, I, my whole family went through just recently, had they approached me with this um, request for understanding and all this 20 years ago, I would not probably not have been able to show them the compassion that I showed them. And I probably wouldn't have been able to bless them and hope that their family heals. I probably would have still had a lot of, harbored a lot of anger because I was hurt for a long time. So... It's, this is a testament to my growth inside this program is because now I can go, yes, I see and I understand and I can love you just, just, just the way you are and I can hold the space for you to heal. So if we put ourselves in someone else's shoes, that kind of gives us that idea. What would it really be like, okay? So number three is we move beyond our self-referencing. So it's practice shifting from our perspective, from exclusive thinking you know, because this is a big, wide world here. This isn't, it, it's not just, I, what did I see the other day? I saw a quote that said, um, people are really going to be surprised when they get the map of the universe and find out they're not standing in the center of it. It's just, it really is. We are not the center of the universe. We're a part of everything else. And so compassion is part of who we are. So practice shifting from our perspective. And 
A quote on this was from Jack Cornfield: Our sorrows and wounds are healed only when we touch them with compassion. Because it's really easy to tear at our wounds, right? But if we touch it with compassion, imagine how much healing will happen. Number four is practice kindness without people pleasing. Ooh, there's a qualifier. It's easy for me to people, it was easy for me to people please, I would say that. I was the ultimate, I probably could have won the, the Grammy Award on people pleasing years ago because I was, as my mother said, I was the glue that held the family together, you know, because I was the people pleaser. I made sure everybody was right and everything. everything. So you have to practice that kindness without the people. Be kind, but have those boundaries. And that's hard. It's a lesson that we learn. These things are simple, but they're hard. <laughs> you know, how many times have we heard that, right? It doesn't mean we're selling out the, the truth for, in order to make someone happy or make somebody feel good. It's authentic kindness, OK? Number five, relax your judgment. Relax our judgment. I'll say that too, our judgment. Okay, it's really easy to judge somebody. It's really easy to slap a label on them and say, this is who they are, that's just who they are. You know? What if we said, took that label off and said, maybe we really don't know who they are. Maybe we haven't given them a chance to become who they are to us. You know, relax our judgment about it. What if we could just let them to keep these labels off? There's no right or wrong. We stay within our own boundaries, and we, we let them be within theirs. And if that keeps them in our circle of friends, it does. If it doesn't, then they'll have other friends to go to. Releasing judgment of others starts with letting go of self-judgments, too. Isn't that easy? How many times in a day does someone say, including myself, um, that's just the way I am? That's just the way I am. Is it now? Or have I just used that as an excuse to not try to open up to not label myself? You know, or that's just the way they are. Well, have they been given the opportunity to make another choice? Maybe they are making the only choice that they can. We don't know, but if we slap the label on them, then we've said, we've, we've, we've judged them. That's who they are. Number six, listen generously. This is a big one for me. And I learned this when I was at the Unity of Phoenix and I was in the chaplain program and we did this listening exercise where people listen at 25%, then they listen at 50%, then they listen at 75%, and then they listen completely. Listening is something that is an art. You have to do it and you can't do it if you've got your stuff. We cannot do it if we've got our phones stuck in our faces. It's not possible. Or if we're distracted by something else or we're typing on the computer or we're or, you know, trying to write notes or whatever, listening generously means actually focusing and listening to the person, right? Without judgment, when you listen generously to people, they hear the truth in themselves, often for the first time. You know, I don't know how many times I've been talking and someone with someone that's listening to me, and by the end of the conversation, I've already answered my own thing because they listened to me and they heard who I was and what I was saying. It's amazing. Number seven, heal your, healing our own trauma. It's a big one. It's hard to do again. Simple techniques out there to do it. But healing trauma, touching ourselves with compassion, right? If we hold in unhealed trauma, it festers. Do they even use that word anymore? Festers. It grows and grows and becomes whatever it needs to become to get out. It'll find a way out. In, in, in lots of other ways, they're finding that scientifically now. People holding in, you know, well, years ago, ulcers was the big thing. Everybody has an ulcer because they were so stressed. It's because all, all, we were holding all this stuff in, right? So compassion is an action word with no boundaries. Prince said that, really. I found that. I was just like, really, Prince? Hmm. An action word with no boundaries. I think it's cool. I, I didn't know he was quite that sophisticated, but you know, it was like, wow, that was cool. Number eight, practice presence. Be where you are when you're there. You're not re rehearse, you know, reliving the past or rehearsing the future. Practice the presence. Try to be fully present with everyone you encounter, right? Avoid looking at your phone multitasking, glancing at the TV, you know, behind your lunch date, 
have you know, the every every restaurant you go into when you can go into a restaurant there's 40 TVs and they're expecting you to look up and look at the TV you know what you're having a conversation at the table but they're distracting with the TVs be be present see if you can really feel what the other person might be thinking beneath the words because there's always something beneath the words and the words may change and the words that they say may not be the words that you understand it is the same way Number nine is to practice radical self-care. And this lady that wrote this book, she's the one, she, 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 I think she has a book called Radical Self-Care. And I have not read it, but I read the synopsis of it. It sounded amazing. But she says, in order to truly offer compassion to others, you first have to fill yourself. Fill your own tank, right? And think, aha, uh -huh, one of my wonderful monks says that compassion is, an, is a verb, right? So there's three quick tips to practice it. So pause for a moment and consider whether or not you're telling yourself about the other person is a story, is, is, it, is it accurate, is it true? And what's the evidence of that belief? And can you think of any counter examples to your belief? Is there any way to counteract that thought? What was it, my husband tells me, we used to have this saying, and we haven't said it in a while, what is it? You always default on the side of the positive. It's always, always think that no matter what they're doing, they're doing it for the right reasons. And it changes. It changes the way you think about things if you try to think that they're, always, they're doing their best. They're always trying to be positive. So if you find that you've been engaging in an all or nothing thought or generalizations, consider a more balanced thought might be instead he, instead of, a, he's a terrible person, you know, consider saying that I don't like that what he did, you know. I always told my children when they were growing up in their, in their late 30s and early 40s now, it's not what you do, you know, I'm not saying that you're a bad person, I'm saying that what you did was not right, <laughs> you know, and I can separate the two, but that, you're still gonna, you're ex gonna, still gonna be held accountable for what you did. So consider engaging in an international act of kindness. Random acts of kindness are amazing. You'd be surprised how many people will pay for the coffee of the person behind them in a car. I heard one time, I don't know, it went on for days at one Starbucks, where it, the word got out, and they always paid for the person behind them because someone had paid for theirs, so they would pay behind and pay behind, and it would go on and on for days. I don't know the record, but it was amazing to hear the story. L just little things like that, you know. Get, get strollers bought for you. Those are amazing. So from the Dalai Lama, I found two wonderful quotes. It says, it's not enough to be compassionate. You must act. And I, I really believe that compassion is the action verb. It, it really, we have to, we, we can feel it, and it's complete when we act on our feelings. And he has another one that says, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. So I'll leave you with this last quote. And it says, this is from Desmond Tutu, and he's a South African angelic archbishop. I quoted him earlier. He's also knowsing, known best for his, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984, and he's been opposing the apartheid in South Africa for way before since then, but way before that. He says, the central concern is the healing of breaches, the redressing of imbalances, the restoration of broken relationships, a seeking to re rehabilitate both the victim and the perpetrator. Who should be given opportunity to reintegrate into the community he has injured by his offense. That's part of what has happened in my life, is I've been asked to be a part of this family again. And with my compassion and my love, I'm willing to be open to do that. And it's an amazing feeling to being on this side of it. And I'm grateful that my recovery has led me here. So let's pray. Higher power, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the words, for the quotes, and for those listening. And I pray that 
it touches the hearts of those that need it most to know that there are people willing to be compassionate towards them, to love them, to not label them, and to be in their presence with them as they are, knowing that compassion is for everyone. We all deserve it. We all are empowered by it, by giving it and receiving. We say thank you. Amen. Thank you, Becky, Linda, Jody, Phil, Bob, Samantha, Frankie, for being here, for helping all of us, for putting this service together. In recovery, we are offered opportunities to be of service. Right here in El Cajon, we have two establishments that could really use our service. The Salvation Army, they need help. They need food donations. Look it up, their address, their website, give them a call. They'll tell you what they need, where to bring it, and the hours that you can bring the food down to them. The other opportunity we have is to give blood to the San Diego Blood Bank. We also have an office here in El Cajon. Their telephone number is 619-441-1804. Give them a call. Let's be of service. We want to work with your organization and bring a place of faith to you. Please contact us through our email at a place of faith at zohomail.com. That's Z O H O M A I L dot com. We're excited to work with you. Thank you for your donations. You can send your donations to the Unity Church of El Cajon, 311 Highland Avenue in El Cajon, 92020. Or you can donate on our website, www.unityofelcajon.org. Hit the donate button. It's very simple, it's easy, it's secure. Please make sure that you put in the memo that it's for the ministry of a place of faith. You can also call Unity Church of El Cajon at 619-579-9586 and give your credit card over the phone. That too is secure and very beneficial. We thank you for supporting this ministry. Jody, would you close us in song? is my decision It's up to me to give of my heart Love is my decision And no one else can tell me to start And once I decide to change my mind God will show me how Love is my decision My decision Right here and now And love is my decision It's up to me to stand on that bridge Love is my decision No one else can make me forget 
Yet once I decide to change my mind, well, God will show me how. And love is my decision, my decision right here and now. It's my decision right here and now. My decision right here and now. Thank you, Jody. Love is my decision. Talk about compassion. Please join me, <clears throat> excuse me, in the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you. See you next week. Here at A Place of Faith, we want you to know that you're not alone. We know how challenging these times are. We want you to know we're all in this together, doing the best that we can, where we are, with what we have. Reaching out and asking for assistance isn't always easy. It takes courage and strength. We understand this struggle as well. Below you will find a list of local resources that are here to assist those in need. If you have an emergency, please dial 911. Your health in mind, body, and spirit are very important to us. Blessings. <laughs>